Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Upunaktu, Sahabiryam Karavavahai, Tejasvinavaditam Astum Avit Vishavahai, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. May that one protect us both, may that one nourish us both. May we work together with great energy. May our study be illumined. We will not unnecessarily cover with each other. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Om Sri Harim Paramanandam Upadastaram Ishwaram Yabakam Sarvalokanam Karanam Tam Namam Yaham I bow down in prostration to that Lord of the Universe the one that is attractive, the world preceptor, Lord of the universe, the all-pervading, the cause of the whole universe and the supreme blissful reality. This uh, opening prayer serves to illustrate the idea that most people view ourselves as creatures in a creation when it comes to dealing with a supreme principle that devout worshippers call popularly God. And so most people involved or who have some kind of faith or declare that they are in some way have this relationship are what we call dualists. About 90%, for example, of the Indian Hindus will be dualists. That is, seeing themselves separately in a corner somewhere and praying to some entity that is outside themselves and maybe even considered inside themselves, but there's still a duality. And the nature of duality is, I see the universe in a multiple way. But is that the only re way of looking at it? Are there other ways? And the fact that we can be philosophers and engage in philosophy doesn't mean to say that we're all in the head and they were all impractical because there are real problems in front of us. And although we register them as problems, do we even have to think of them as problems? Do we have to think that I am an isolated individual beset with difficulties showered on me? And uh, this creates a difficulty because if any religious faith declares that the supreme is equivalent to love then a very serious question gets raised and it is raised these days by what we call neo-atheists new atheists who have a very very important point to make so if god is love and beaming love and justice everywhere how is it that amputees are around Surely an omnipotent God, a loving God, would enable somebody to grow arms. Because a salamander, if you cut its tail off, can grow another tail. And surely God is greater than this. And why is there so much misery and difficulties in the world? Why are we suffering? And of course, the basis of such a question is because of a view which we can call a dualistic view. When we talk about Vedanta, and today and I, tonight's talk will be the basis of Vedanta, what is Vedanta at its root, at its core, at the very base? And do we have to think of things in a dualistic way? Or can philosophy be something like a toolbox that we can apply? And if we can look at the whole range within the Vedanta, well, then the, it seems for most cases, the most useful and versatile tool will be what we call non-dualism. But non-dualism doesn't mean to say, as many would have it, that everything is illusion. 
this would be a mistake. When I fall down and hurt my knee, well, there's a dent in the ground, no doubt, for which I could be blamed, but there's also a pain in my knee. They can't get away from it. I can't just dismiss it as irrelevant or imagination or, il or just illusion, a kind of magic trick that God and his cruelty pay, plays on me. So there has to be some different way of looking at the universe if it is to be practical. And if it's not practical, then it cannot really have much value for us. We cannot use it as a tool to make adjustments. If somebody says to me that atoms are basically radiation that can be proven, of course, it can be verified by taking the simplest atom. We can blast it and we find radiation. You can take the simplest atom, hydrogen atom, you can disintegrate it, you can melt it back into an ocean of radiation. Does that prove that when the carpenter goes to make a table at our request, that we have to talk about radiation? He said, don't worry about the dimensions or the materials that we can use. It's all, it's all atoms, and atoms are basically fundamentally radiation, but that's not what we see. That's not how we relate to it. We relate to it in a very different way. We should be able to say to the carpenter, I want, let's say, mahogany wood. I want uh, some other wood, maybe. I want this length. I want uh, maybe this width. And for daily usefulness, we should not let go of a common sense view of things. And viewing the world in a multiple way from a dualistic point of view would be perfectly appropriate for our waking state, our normal sort of view of the world, our sense-bound view of the world, we might say. But when we are dealing with sense-bound things and we try to get some views out of them, then we have to follow certain laws. We have no other option but to follow the law of gravity when we walk. When we sit, we don't just suddenly fly off somewhere. We know that gravity is there. We may not know what it is, but when Isaac Newton discovered the laws of gravity, he never understood what was gravity. He just accepted it. So these are things that need to be explained. And the only way to explain difficult things is to shift our point of view. For one problem, there may be a thousand different points of views. We may look at things from a thousand different areas. Let us take, for example, our own individuality, so-called. Then we can split it up into certain areas, functional areas. We can say that the body that has toes and feet and hands and fingers and so on, that work together in a coordinated way, operated by a central operating system, which we call the brain. Well, this is made from, when you boil it down, when you see what are its constituent parts, the essence of it is different from the parts. It is made from yesterday's food. And the miracle is, how does a tomato that is fed through one hole in the face come out as White, a white beard. It's a, something which is miraculous. We can study the chemistry of it, and we can study the energetic value of it, but where does the energy come from? And even where does the food come from? And then we are expanding our question, where does the universe itself come from? So we have to obey certain laws within the waking world for us to be practical. But you see, if in spite of all our carefulness in obeying all the laws that we are involved in, in spite of that, and we run against some obstacle, and we wonder why we got it, perhaps thinking, look, I'm an honest person, I'm a good person, I'm a generous person, I'm trying to lead a good life, so why should I run into any difficulties? And what is it that uh, puts the obstacle there in the first place? Because when I look at my life, I see all kinds of obstacles. 
And some of, sometimes the scenario of these obstacles come out as hilarious comedies, slapstick comedies, beginning maybe with the obstacle of a banana skin and slipping out carelessly. And then if I'm carrying something, it's displayed all over a pavement and then somebody else slips and so on, a calamity of difficulties. You try and tidy up something and then a whole uh, stack of papers falls and then you're scrambling there and as you're scrambling, you'll bump your head. So it can go on like that. And we laugh at that until it happens to ourselves. So should obstacles necessarily be there? Is that part of our obligatory experience? Or can I shift in my viewpoint? And can I get clear, avoiding it, bypassing it, ultimately getting into a position where such things don't recur to me at all? Is it possible? Is, this, is there the world exactly as I find it here and now in this context, or are there other viewpoints? where perhaps the resistance that we find now won't be felt. So now that's a tool for knowledge and its application in daily life. If there is such a thing, it will be a verification. Yes, it removed the obstacle for me. It bypassed it. It showed me a way of getting around it in a calm way, in a systematic way, and perhaps even in a joyful way. So, when we talk of Vedanta, we are not eliminating dualism. We see the value of it. And the non-dualistic position also uses the causal connection. Because some, for some areas, for example, of point of view or argument, that something has been created, but at the last moment, the non-dualist takes it away. He takes away any idea of causation or creation. And so these awkward questions don't arise. How is it that God made such a funny world? It doesn't arise with the non-dual tool that we apply. Because we can find out that the non-dual reality is absolutely perfect. It has no defects. There are no obstacles in it. There's, because there is no duality in it. There's no multiplicity in it. There's only, as it says, a non-dual existence. We can hardly imagine such a thing, but we can appreciate the principle of it. And we can also practice it. If we have the principle, but not the practice, then it is, has no value. And so, the same person who faces the difficulty can now say, well, I, or previously might have said, I own this body, this body is a little old and creaking. I own the mind, which sometimes has got, you know, bad behaviors, bad habits, bad memory even as I get older. And sometimes it has good memories. So I, the person who's connected with this body-mind complex, the psychophysical thing, I can, uh, can be interpreted, felt and verified also to be a non-dual ultimate principle. And in some contexts, it would be easy to verify it. And in many contexts, it may not be necessary to verify it. But having the ultimate tool, it can be a pleasure to face the world. It's no longer a world of obstacles, difficulties. The poor me attitude can be replaced. What a glory, what a glory. Because if you have this ultimate tool of non-dualism, in one hand, you, you, you can take the temporary tools from anywhere for daily life, and that's a kind of game that you can play. Non-duality, Advaita, which is often interpreted as Vedanta, is a system which doesn't contradict anything. So it's really not conclusively non-dualism, because it simply surpasses and supplements many things. The ordinary tools are useful in many contexts. The carpenter making a table is an example. But the ultimate tool is useful 
in practically all the contexts you can think of. Only the technique is if you can play it as a game, if you can view life as a game. A person who studies non-duality properly will not take this world as a difficulty, but will take it as a game, as a leela, as a sport. And that is why that great mystic Sri Ramakrishna said that it's a double-edged thing, two sides of the same coin, the eternal nitya on the one side and leela on the other side. There's a wonderful book called The Imprisoned Splendor by Raynaud Johnson. This was uh, so quite an old book because it goes back before the atom was divided into radiation. In fact, it was, well, it was just afterwards, actually, but he anticipated it. The first publication of this book was something like uh, 1953, no doubt. But this is a physicist who is also a chemist who explored and was brave enough to explore every aspect of phenomena. His book has several parts. He talks about the data of natural science. He talks about the apparent microcosm and the macrocosm. He talks about the data of psychical research also that is dismissed by modern science. And here we find a compatibility with the opening introductory statements made by Swami Vivekananda in his Raja Yoga. Psychical research, including telepathy, clairvoyance, it reminds me really of some foolish, childish questions that I asked a great teacher uh, who guided me for the whole of my life, really. And the first silly question was, what about telepathy? Well, how do you explain this? And calmly he explained the principle of a cosmic mind. There's only one mind. And then he compared it like a radio broadcast. And from then, of course, I've been using this example ever since. And then the second, another part he puts out is the data of mystical experience. He doesn't leave it out. But finally, he writes a chapter, the significance of the whole. And therein is a section, the purpose of human life. And here he mentions in summarizing the whole thing, life can have no meaning, no purpose, unless you take it as a kind of game. Of course, he had studied Vedanta. And so in this book, The Imprisoned Splendor, then you find towards the end of the chapter, the significance of the whole, the, this answer, and being a professor, a physics professor, then he writes about physics with knowledge, and then he goes into chemistry, and of course, as was known at the time, of course, there have been tremendous advances since then in both of these disciplines, and, but he would, and he could anticipate, uh, sooner or later, the nucleus of the hydrogen atom could be released, or would be released, and the packet uh, would be untied and the so-called solid world of hydrogen would be verified as its substratum called radiation. Now it's worthwhile pointing out that as a, a kind of part of the structure, the practical explanatory structure of the whole of the universe will come really from Kapila Sankhya where he has some 24 different elemental categories or tattos, elements. And we can see how this world, and we were talking about this with uh, a devotee on Sunday. Uh, Sunday, yes, yesterday. And so we had to go through what I normally go through, which is the Tanmatras. We don't start there, of course. We start with what we call our waking world. And for convenience sake, we can put 16 factors in there. We have five organs, humanly speaking, five organs of absorption, information, jnana indriya, information flows in through the sense organs, eyes, ears, and so on. 
But then we can't leave it there. There has to be a reaction. And the reaction comes from another component called mind. And this reaction is an outgoing thing through legs and hands and so on. Five of them. So now you have 10 plus mind 11. But then it must relate to five objects. And so you have a total of 16 items there. This is the common world, but it's not a standard view, because if you have some other instrument, it'll look different. The world will look completely different. If I have one more sense, it looks different. If I take away one sense, it looks different. If I take away the sense of color, the world looks different. If I take away the sense of sound, the world seems different. And so we understand that all other organic beings may have different relational uh, senses and sensors to interpret the world with. And then we have to go to where do these senses come from? Where does this world come from? These 16 items, this waking world, comes from a more or a less defined kind of world, a more nebulous region where we have five subtle elements wave structures and these wave structures will then exhibit some energy value so that electromagnetism which is essentially the atomic structure yields to agni radiation and radiation will yield to kinetic energy and then potential energy like that the very ancient atheists only had four elements and they said since there is no purpose in life then we may as well live a hedonistic life we can eat we can drink we can be merry we can entertain all the senses we can expand the waking world as the only existence but they really never examined the world properly even though they had as sound a philosophy as any of the neo-atheists today so we see that uh, basically there is no matter today. The whole of matter has been exploded. We can reduce it even to this factor of radiation. But the world of experience, we can find, of course, all these things, the atomic structures configured as tables and chairs. But you see another person who knew this was Swami Vivekananda. And in his Jnana Yoga lectures, you find this. He also knew science to some extent, as it was in those days. Of course, the language changes. In those days, you couldn't say energy. You had to say force because it was all Newtonian. But when he dictates his Raja Yoga book in Boston, which is published in 1895, he also had enough scientific understanding to know that sooner or later physics will arrive at a unity beyond matter. It doesn't look as it seems. And so he uses that as the basis for his writings on Jnana Yoga, his lectures. So after discussing anyway the conclusion of physics bordering on the realization of the hydrogen nucleus and not necessarily matter, dispensing now with matter because everything dissolves into its true form, radiation. This author, Raynor Johnson of the Imprisoned Splendor, he goes on to discuss these conclusions of all of these avenues, biology, psychology, parapsychology, Duke University mysticism, something that today seems worth revisiting. And... Uh, we should and could revisit this book, even though it may be somewhat out of date. But the conclusions are even more radical today because we know from 1900, well, from 1905 onwards, and Raynald Johnson would have known it also, but Swami Vivekananda would not have known it in the scientific context, that everything can be resolved back into one thing, namely energy. But what is energy? Nobody knows, except the Vedantins, who have this word for it. The yogis have the language of prana. The tantrikas have the language of shakti. And the Vedantins have the language of 
Saguna Brahman. So, despite the different descriptions, it is the same thing. One energy, one matter called Agasha, and one energy called Prana. And all the systems use the concepts of the Sankhya divisions. These mere elements combining and recombining, once you know it, the whole world becomes different and you start to see things through the lens of practical non-dualism. To see on the one side is the eternal, but on the other side is this play of waves everywhere. And that means then that I have to deal with life as a kind of game. And being caught up in the body-mind complex, a body which is sure to perish one day in a jumping mind, tied to an unstable position, we can actually attain the truth, even despite that, just using it, converting it, looking at it in a different way. The absolute, the perfect, the immortal, from which all things seem to be starting, which seems to sustain everything, we can look toward that. And so we have to bridge the gap between these two positions, the multiplicity on one side and the unity on the other side. Naturally, one would ask, well, what can you do from this to become that? This is Reynold Johnson in The Significance of the Whole. And he makes this claim, he says, at this particular position, the only way to get some help, to get some hint as to what could be done actually he mentions will be the Indian theory of Leela, sport. And only at that point is it useful. And so, initially we may not see the value and use, the functionality of non-dualism as a tool or technique. But when we see that the other side of the coin is this Leela, a series of waves, and where do these waves come from? They come from a cosmic mind. We are still in the realm of duality. We're not denying anything. We are supplementary every position. Imagine taking a train from Dublin to Belfast, for example, and not going through Newry. We don't cancel Newry out. We go through it. So dualism is accepted as a practical thing. Taking it like a toolbox and then seeing the connectedness with everything, that's another approach. But seeing everything as one thing, one energy manifesting in different configurations as mere waves. Each time there's a complex configuration, we get something more solid, more defined, until ultimately it exhibits itself in this world that we know, and not in a disconnected way, because all the elements that we know have characteristics of those waves put in a different form. Let us take, for example, radiant, radi irradiance, uh, radiation. Radiation, well, if we discounted radiation, if we really couldn't understand it and see it, then we would not be able to see or observe or even feel the rays of the sun. If we didn't understand the solidity of the electromagnetic field, then we would not put our feet and squirm our toes in the mud and feel the earth. And so we can't make a disconnectedness. Now here's the thing, and I'll use an example that I've used before, so forgive my repetition. And I'd like to use the classical tale, Shakespeare's Hamlet. Now there's a very sh famous Shakespearean actor, Irving, who plays this part of Hamlet. We find reference to this in this Reynold Johnson's book. Supposing we, Irving, the Shakespearean actor, is playing the part of Hamlet. Then it's a part on the stage, everybody knows it. Even my description tells us there is a separation of these two. Now that's a real sport. But the question can be, how can Hamlet, or what can Hamlet do to become Irving? What can I do to become divine? What can I do to get liberation? What can I do to be one with this absolute perfection? What can I do to be one with God? What can I do to get this mystic union is an absurd question from the non-dualistic point of view. 
because Irving and Hamlet were never two separate things. Irving has to do nothing to become Hamlet, and Hamlet can never become Irving because the two are the, exactly the same. The part being played and the actor are ex identical. And so we can't really ask the question at all. There are no two. And our immediate answer, if we say, what will Irving do to become Hamlet? Well, Irving has never become Hamlet. He's playing the part. It's a game. Well, there's no need for Hamlet to become Irving. And there's no need for Irving to confuse himself with Hamlet. He is. And where you see Hamlet and shake his hand, you're really shaking Irving's hand. There's nobody else there. So there are no two. There's no question of becoming. You're the only pure being, only one being. And if Irving hasn't become Hamlet, then the question of Hamlet becoming Irving is a counter sense and a counter sense. The whole thing does not arise. By now you know this. So if the ultimate principle, that is the divinity or what devout worship has called God, the non-dual one, is all that exists and is playing the part of me and you and everything else, then what can we all do to become that? Nothing. So the question is irrelevant. It has to become, it, is, uh, it has not to become us, and we are not to become it. It is a one thing playing a part. And then what should we do? We should just play the part well. We shouldn't withdraw. We shouldn't say it's all illusion. We shouldn't stop the part, stop the play. Because here is the real, real philosophical evidence, if you will, of this non-dual position, that the Vedanta puts out not one state of consciousness, but three stages of consciousness, three conditions that consciousness operates in. And waking state is only one dimension of it, is only one scene of it. And all we have to do is play our part in that. All the others is just unconscious, can't do anything about it. So then why are we frightened? The real understanding of non-duality will make us sports people, will make us adventurous. All fear will be removed. A kind of philosophical sportsmanship in the game of the world and the adventure. And we take everything on with an adventurous spirit if we take this non-dual philosophy in its right way. Fearless, abhaya, absolute fearlessness. This, an attitude of, come what may, let me face it head on. I don't have to crash into any problem. There's no problem. There's no victory. There's no defeat in a game. You may think that there is, and sports fans may think there is, and they may get hostile, like primitive tribes, about different allegiances of, say, football. And so the worthlessness or the worthwhileness even, of a game is that it shouldn't end very fast. When will this, end, this game end? When will I get my freedom? An attitude like this has no concern of these questions. And then this my old example of a tennis game. See, I take a tennis bat and when, then I, I can give a very hard service. And the other person on the other side can't take it. So in this game, I get the first point. And then I hit again on this side, and I get the score. And he does the same thing. It's a kind of service game where nobody returns the ball. And so anybody in the spectator, in the spectator seats, they'll say, we will walk out. We won't watch this match. It's boring. 30, 40 times with lightning flash, the ball just goes scraping the net right and left, line placing, net placing here, there. If you do that, the audience will applaud. All the spectators will rise on their feet. There'll be an excitement, a thrill in the crowd. Every time there's a marginal thing happening, supposing deuce, one ball takes 30 minutes, and then you say, 
Gentlemen, the game will be continued for the next two hours. Nobody will watch such a game. One ball starting in one hour finished. It's a nice game to see how accurate these people are these days in their skill in tennis. That's worthwhile watching. They seem to be possessed equally of the spirit of tennis. Then it's a worthwhile game. And ultimately, of course, the ball must go. It's replayed the other way. So it's always 5-all, 6-all, 8-all, 20-all, 100-all, 2,000-all, etc. Those who play tennis will know the proper scoring. But there's no person who takes the two games successively. That's an interesting game. The set will never end. It's called reincarnation. Replay. It's quite good. It's always deuce, deuce. No winner, no loser. And it's worth seeing such a match, of course. A fast ending thing isn't a game, isn't a game at all. It's certainly not a game worth playing. So one stroke, he can't take it. Then he serves, I can't take it. What kind of game is that? That's no use. It becomes an adventure. Don't ask why obstacles came there for. Why not? You're playing a game. Why do you get so anxious about it? It is a game. Play the game well. So why don't you tell God, Lord, you don't play on my side because that makes me lazy. That's no good. I can sit back and ask. You stand and you stand ceremonially with a bat. I stand ceremonially, let's say, with a bat. But he, being a supreme player, playing all over the field and I standing like that, not doing anything. So when it comes to winning the trophy, I go and show my hand and take the trophy. Myself or my partner scored the victory. But of course, I didn't play at all. What kind of game is that? It's a begging game. I stood still like that and said, Lord, I'm in trouble. Lord, save me, save me. I'm desperate. I'm panicking. Lift me up, O oh teacher. Well, I'm broken down here. Please fix my car. Raise me up. Do something for me. Bring the crane and lift me up. Well, then the right master lifts you up. What game is that? It's not a game at all. And it's just mean cowardice. And so when Krishna talks to Arjun and says, where is this cowardice coming from? He's taking really the attitude which is non-dual. And he's, uh, so if the right master lifts you up when you're in trouble, bogged down somewhere, then the credit should go not to the master, should go to the crane. You're lifted, of course, pitifully. In a real game, what should I say? Lord, you stand at the base. I will play the game. You and I on this side, that's useless. I won't do that. Lord, you play on the opposite side. You play a game of singles with me. You strike your most divine blows. And then finished. It's a pleasure to be defeated by you, Lord. Now come on, repeat the difficult ball. And repeat it a thousand times till I take it successfully. Till I learn the skill of returning it nicely. Till all your knowledge comes to me. Then I must tell him, strike hard, I'll take it. And so the non-dualistic view makes us quite fearlessness, makes us quite fearless, makes us cheerful. And in the greatest difficulties, therefore, this tool will be the most useful. It's worth studying it. And if you read the books written by the other people, they'll ridicule this. Oh, it's just an illusion, this non-dualism. So this, evidently, you and I are separate. We can't get away from it. And the attainment or the attainment of liberation or attainment of God's grace did not necessarily liberate us because it didn't take away our struggles. It didn't take away our pain. We have to struggle independently. If that is the case, then there is a necessity for you and me to act on the basis that we are separate from the ultimate reality. That will be valid. 
in the circumstance. And from those people who attain the sainthood on, it's in olden days of all religions and cultures, for all practical purposes then, yes, you and I are separate, no doubt. From one another, we are separate. From the ultimate principle, we are separate. So there is a becoming necessity when things get difficult. So we can't really fully count on a duality. Lord, save me. And so the people who have the duality of worship, thinking that God is a loving God, still have the problem, why is there pain in the universe? The non-dualists don't have this problem. The non-dual system doesn't contradict duality because we can play the game. If it's a game, then it's better to have many, not one alone. And in the field of utility also, it's not wrong to accept a dualistic philosophy either. You're separate from me, I'm separate from you. We are separate from the ultimate reality and the inner self. But the knowing principle inside me, I know is the same, is one without a second. It's the subject. So while playing the multiple game, where it suits me, I know behind it all, when I study it properly, and that's the use, for, use of studying this philosophy, I still have at the back of my mind that there is a philosophical principle which stands there. It's inside me. It's the eternal subject. And naturally, the things known, the body and the mind and the emotions, they're all in the field, but there is a know of the field. In the language of the Bhagavad Gita, there's the kshetra, the field, and the kshetra jna, the knower of the field. And so, should I accept this duality at the basic level? Is it compulsory? No, it's not. Because there's a way in which duality works, and I can use the duality tool when I need it. But when I need it, I can use the non-dual weapon also, just as obligingly. So we must mark the differences, otherwise we shall be swept off. We should not be swept off by those who think that non-dualism is just illusionism of something of that nature. See, Swami Vivekananda, he takes Raja Yoga, which is a dualistic system, and he, can, he gives it a non-dual presentation. Sankhya and Yoga are dualistic philosophies. In fact, Sankhya is not only dualistic, it's atheistic. It has no God. It may have a kind of a functioning office of Brahma that comes out at the beginning of every cycle of the universe, something like that. But it's not a God in the conventional sense. But it has an eternal self, or it has a Purusha, an individual self. As many people, as many Purushas. Why do they have that? Because if Jesus was enlightened, then we'd all be enlightened if we were the same thing. But that's not the fact of it. The fact of it is the unity comes at the transcendent level. So if I say that uh, dualistic or dualism is also useful, the tools of knowledge can be useful, then I have to say, well, there's a limit to that because food is useful to me, but does it mean that I'm hungry now? Food is useful only to me when I'm hungry. And drink is only useful to a thirsty man. And shelter is only necessary, or blankets and woolen dress are necessary for a shivering man. But am I shivering all the time? Medicine is necessary for a sick man. But should we take medicine all the time? The usefulness has a limit. And if my whole life is found useful and everything is found useful and I find everything useful, then I must be a hopeless blank that has to be filled and adjusted all the time. An empty bucket into which everything can be put. Everything is useful. Food and other things are useful in their place because every use implies a want and a minus, a gap, something that has to be filled. And as I say many times before, what is the definition of desire? 
It is a feeling of gap, an empty area, a void somewhere that has to be filled from the outside. But my non-dualistic philosophy says, there are no gaps. It is all full and overflowing. There's no want, there's no deficit. So could I not be something which is full, which beams out the fullness and spills over into the neighborhood? Could I not stand there in that position, beaming like this? Would that be no, not be more useful than sitting in a corner saying, poor me, when will I be saved? When will I get my realization and my revelation? The sun beams forth, it sends its beaming rays forth. It's not an empty bucket into which you put a prayer or something like that, or some food or some tea. It's not a cup or something like that. It doesn't take anything inside in the ordinary sense. It pours out its fullness. It doesn't ask to be filled. Could I not be a thing like that? Everywhere the sun is worshipped because it is a beaming, life-giving entity. It is a symbol of the divine. Could I not take the lesson and be like that? Somebody asked me today, so have I grown spiritually? And he puts his hand out and makes a mark, like something like about two foot off the ground. Am I here or am I here? And I said, you cannot measure spiritual growth in this way. Spiritual growth is measured by the expansion of a heart. It's like a flower. The maximum it opens, you see what a generosity of spirit it has, a wonderful analogy. And we know that there is growth when all our ideas expand and where fear, fear, fearfulness goes away and fearlessness replaces itself and we beam and a flower beams not only its colors, not only its mood, if you will, its brightness, its uh, architectural structure, which is a marvel, but it also, and its activity, its opening activity, but it also beams its fragrance. And it doesn't matter whether you have a nose or don't have a nose, it still is generous enough to display itself. So could I not put a mental movement instead of a prayer saying, please fill this, please fill that, a mental movement on the ground that from fullness, it's beaming out. That question must be asked because a thing is useful. It doesn't mean that it's the right philosophy. It's an economic system, just commerce and industry. So for every want, there's a supply and that's granted. But am I a thing full of wants? Am I something like, a, like a, a perforated sheet full of holes and everything is plugged in? Or is it a, a credit that God made all his creatures full of holes? What kind of God, God is that? And made them beg and struggle to fill up the holes like that? So this is a kind of common understanding that some dualists may have in it's a kindergarten beginning point of view no doubt but at some point we have to shift there are no holes there's no deficits god made the world and saw that it was good it is our job to see it like that and to understand we are made in the image and likeness of that supreme principle so what is this universe? Is it full of holes? No, from where do you fill them if it is? From another hole? See, that's a rotten system and we shouldn't use it and we shouldn't have that idea. So we can say that this is full and it is full and it is free. And why not? I have a thinking a thinking instrument. So why do we talk? I have got a tongue. Why do you look at me? Because I've got eyes to see. Why should I not use them? I need not be a blank to be using the eyes and the tongue. It need not restrict me. I can be a full thing also. Therefore, using the tongue fearlessly, therefore, using the eyes fearlessly can be like a game. 
And the non-dualistic philosophy is not easily brushed aside by somebody just writing a book to say, oh, it's illusion, or it's above us, or it's transcendent, it has no practical value, or all of these things. Sanskrit formula for it means it will not have a mutual contradiction, but it will be surpassing any contradictions. If you call it a transcendental philosophy, it will include all the philosophies and plus one. And so Vedanta is a religion, if you will, or a system of plus ones. And you see it clearly if you say these are 16 items here. Well, that's not all there is. But to a materialist, that's all there is. And then behind it, underneath it, expressing itself in this way as the observable universe, is a series of subtle waves, all dancing and playing. But these are divine waves that are doing it. If you see this world as a game, as a play of waves, and then enter into the game fully with an adventurous attitude, and play the game well, then all your difficulties and problems will go away without removing them, but simply shifting your position. So the non-dualistic system is based mainly upon a study of these three states of awareness, the waking, dream, and dream of sleep. Very easily we can then see where we are. It is not dream alone, all three states. If you want to understand the properties of matter, you say, let's say, two white powders. You take them. Now, if you want to test what the content are, or the contents are, well, if you take sugar, which is white, and put it in water, it will dissolve. But if you take calcium carbonate, lime, and put it there, it won't dissolve. It will sit there. So you know the difference between these two things. In the same way, when you know the difference between these states, it gives you some information. So like that, we are thinking beings, we are conscious, we use our thought. And for example, if you tell me, look here, then I will look. And if you say, listen to this, then I will listen, my attention will go wherever you direct it. And if you say, feel this, then I'd say, no, no, it's rather peculiar stuff, it's dark. You must tell me whether it is silk or something else, then I will gently see what it is. So I can use my thought power to attend very closely to certain things. Even minute things could be detected, or big things can also be detected. And so a broad view, a pointed view, all kinds of things are possible because the thought power seems to be a kind of lighted area which can be wielded by us and directed. This is the key to meditation. You can direct it here, direct it there, wherever your attention seems to go. This is the game. To assert, I am not the attention, I am not the field, I am not the waves in the field. I am different and separate to them. That's an initial position until I understand even the waves are me, I am that. What a glorious understanding that can be. So we are not just mediators only, or meditators only, or yoga practitioners only, or examiners. We are examiners, in fact, of the meditative performance. We are a witness of our own meditation. It's not that we are meditating to understand our identity. It is the identity that is watching. You are an estimated, an estimating principle that carries out the meditation by some technique, and some kind of peculiar inward poising, and got the thing, we got the thing to work by that standing back as a poised entity and estimating it. We're not really meditating in that case. We're also judging. We're also somehow executing it. And somehow by the same mysterious process, standing out and looking at it and estimating it and evaluating it. And so when the mind jumps here and there, 
I decide I won't allow it. Now tomorrow morning I must prepare myself. I'll study something. I won't be caught off guard. I'll develop a theme. I can do it because I am not the activities that go on within the mental field. So two things come out of this, the non-dualistic philosophy. Its truth is not in theory. It's not in the dry things that you find, oh, the Upanishads I can't study. It's all dry philosophy. I can't understand a word that Swami Purananda says. You probably can't. But it is actually in educating ourselves to stand poised in the non-dual position. And when we do that, then all the things that are in the field don't affect us. Fear is gone. We have to make this poised position our natural home, our base. That makes for basic Vedanta. Not being a corrector of things, not being a jester of things, not being a person that sees the world as in any way defective, not being affected or influenced by all of those external statements and difficulties. There is a, a, a statement that is there in the Munduku Upanishad. It tells us, Brahmevedam Amritam Purustad Brahma Pashat Brahma Dakshina Tascha Uttarani Adascha Udham Cha Prustritam Brahmevedam Vishwam Idam Varishtam. That highest principle, supreme principle, that Brahman, as we call it, is immortal. Be Brahman is before, Brahman is after. Is the south and the north, extends upwards and downwards. And by Brahman indeed is this entire universe rendered great. Why do we see it as a diminished thing, a small area of our life where we, problems beset us? So it need not be like this. We can shift our understanding. And when we do that, it becomes a practical, delightful sport. And a person who has that attitude may have a prayer like this, maybe a slight complaint at the end of the day. Lord, today you never give me a curveball. Please arrange one for tomorrow. Thank you. Om Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Thanks. Thank you, Sanji. Good, thank you. Thank you, Sanji. Oh. Mm -hmm.